Welcome to today's webinar, Evidence-Informed Decision-Making, Using Research Evidence to Inform Practice. My name's Dr. Joanna Schwartzman. I'm a Research Fellow in the Child and Family Evidence Team here at the Australian Institute of Family Studies. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of the Gunurong and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land that I'm speaking from today. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, as well as any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us today on the webinar. But while this webinar focuses on the use of research evidence in combination with other sources of knowledge, I'd like to recognise that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge, including knowledge of what works for Aboriginal families and services, is integral to decision making in practice. I'd also like to acknowledge the many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander researchers who've contributed to the body of research evidence as well. So, welcome everyone to what we hope will be an engaging discussion about how we can support and enhance the way we work by building an evidence base into our practice. Joining me in the discussion today, we have a panel um, with experience that spans the breadth and depth of this topic. Each of our presenters has unique and shared experience of working on both sides of research and practice. So I'd like to introduce Ken Knight from the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Hello, Ken. Amanda Payton from the Australian Centre for Child Protection. Hi everyone. Hi Amanda. And Beth McCann from the Centre for Family Research and Evaluation at Drummond Street Services. Hi, Hello everybody. Beth. Hi. Hi. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, so setting the scene for today's discussion. This webinar will explore how research evidence can be used to support decision making in programs and practice and organisations in the child, family and community welfare sectors. Our aim is to give you some ideas to take away about how to integrate research into decision making at the practice level or the, the programmatic or planning level. And to help you understand some of the challenges that are commonly faced to improving evidence informed decision making within an organisation. Um, in the discussion, I'll ask questions of the panellists about frameworks for getting evidence into practice and what helps to support research use in organisations. Some of the barriers and enablers of integrating research into practice and ask our panellists to provide examples of approaches that support evidence-informed practice in their settings that they've worked in. And give examples of how organisations and practitioners have successfully combined research evidence with other types of knowledge to create impact or change. So, let's get uh, stuck into some questions of our panellists. And Ken, I was, really want to interested in starting with you because I know you've worked in the field of knowledge translation for many years and you've supported many people to think about how they create research evidence that will be useful for practice as well as supporting practitioners to use that research evidence in their decision making. Are you able to explain for us today what is evidence informed decision making and what are some of the key concepts that are related to evidence-informed decision-making. Thank you, Joe, and, and hi, everyone. Um, and, and yes, I will try my best, but that's quite a big question that you've posed. Um, and I'd like to also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country on which I live and work, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I'd also like to uh, provide a little bit of, uh, I guess, um, 
broader context uh, before we hear from some from, from some of the more applied examples. Uh, and I guess the question of what is evidence-informed decision-making, what is evidence-informed practice is something which is uh, dear to my heart and the space that I've worked in for the past 12 years, uh, really bringing uh, what I would call a knowledge translation and research impact lens to making evidence more relevant, more accessible and applying evidence in quite specific contexts. Uh, and I did work for many years as part of the Child Family Community Australia Information Exchange, so it's it's really brilliant to be back uh, and speak as part of this event today. So while the concept of evidence-informed decision-making and evidence-informed practice is relatively straightforward, it's about ensuring that the decisions that we make and the actions that we take are informed by the best available evidence. The subsequent questions that this process raises for all of us about the nature of evidence and the ways that we work, you know, I think we have to acknowledge are really quite big and complex. Uh, and today, I think we also have to acknowledge that we will only probably skim the surface uh, of, of this field, but hopefully begin or, or continue for those of you who, are, who have been thinking about this work for some time, a much larger and sector-wide conversation about doing this important, necessary work as well as we can. Um, but I guess to, to kind of set the scene, I'd, I'd like to share some slides with you. So if we could have the first slide, please. Brilliant, thank you. So I, I really like this image and I think it's a helpful place to start because it reflects the striking reality for most practitioners. That sense of overwhelm is real and justifiable. And many of us feel, I think, at imminent risk of being swept away by the sheer scale of the available research evidence. And so just to contextualize that in the field that I work in currently, health and medical research, we have over 2000 research articles published every day internationally. Uh, and while this poses amazing opportunities to address wicked problems in child and family health and wellbeing, but we've never known so much as we do at this moment, there is no individual organization or system that can currently make sense of or integrate at that scale of evidence production. So I think the hard reality that we face in this space is that there is no simple fix uh, and we do need to embrace some complexity in this work. Applying research evidence in decision making and in practice is also not just a matter of, of following a series of procedural steps. And, and I think all of you will relate to that if you've tried it. Um, and, and I think similarly, if you're a parent, you will know that raising a child is not a matter of reading and applying the child rearing manual. What we're talking about here is complex practices uh, that do require skill and situational judgment, which comes from experience as well as evidence about what works. And so in my work and the approach that I take uh, to, to try and address this complexity uh, is using the tools and the processes provided by the field of knowledge translation. Uh, and this is about bridging that gap between what is known or the evidence and then what we do, how we make decisions and, and what we do in our practice. And so you may have noticed that I'm, I'm using the term knowledge here uh, as well as evidence, or, or rather, as my preferred term, uh, rather than evidence. Uh, and I think that this is you know, a fundamental tricky question that we need to grapple with when we're talking about this, this area. Uh, how do we know what we know? How do we approach sharing that knowledge? And fundamentally, how do we apply that knowledge once we're sure that it's the right knowledge uh, that, that we need to be grappling with? And I think linked to that question uh, of what is knowledge and how do we know what we know is a key awareness here that there are multiple types of knowledge and that to address challenges in child and family health and wellbeing, we do need a unified approach that brings together uh, these key areas of what is known. And so you can see them here on the slide. We have research knowledge, which is held by researchers primarily, but we also have practice knowledge, which is primarily held by practitioners. We have experiential knowledge or lived experience knowledge, which is held by parents and community members. We have organizational knowledge, which is held by service system organizers. And we have policy knowledge, which is held by policymakers. And so going back to the, the, the question that you asked me around, you know, what is an evidence-based or an evidence-informed approach? At heart, uh, it, it's about an attempt to bring these different necessary perspectives together. 
And so here we can see this is this is the ACE model uh, of evidence-informed approaches. You will likely have seen this model, or you will likely have seen other models, or have your own model uh, for evidence-informed approaches, evidence-informed practice, or evidence-informed decision making. And again, it's about linking these separate, often fragmented and siloed areas. But I guess the fundamental question in my work, and I think in all of our work in today, is how? How do we do this? This is lovely to kind of bring together conceptually, but what's our way in? And I think fortunately, uh, in response to that question, is that there are frameworks to guide us uh, and an excellent place to start uh, and provide a map and a compass to kind of navigate this tricky terrain. So on screen here is a diagram depicting the appropriately named knowledge to action framework, which some of you may be familiar with. The central circle here uh, reflects the process of knowledge and evidence creation. Importantly, this framework recognises that there is a gap that we need to bridge between what we know and what we do, and that this bridging of the gap uh, and that applied kind of work uh, requires significant and structured effort. So here we also see in the outer cycle a continuous iterative ring that involves identifying real world problems and linking and tailoring relevant knowledge, adapting the selected knowledge to a local context, identifying local barriers to the uptake and use of that knowledge, selecting and tailoring interventions to overcome those barriers, monitoring knowledge use, evaluating outcomes, and sustaining knowledge use. And I think importantly in this model, uh, this, is, this is not a kind of a one directional way. This, this kind of goes in all directions, but also fundamentally that the research and knowledge generation is informed by real world problems, uh, not just kind of, you know, people kind of cooking up good questions that, that are then to be applied by others. And I think then, you know, taking that step back and kind of bringing some of this together is that the promise, the proposed impact, if we can do this well, if we can have a structured and meaningful approach to this work, is that the research evidence, the knowledge will be more relevant, more accessible and more likely to be applied. And in turn, the policy and practice will be able to apply and have the capacity to apply that knowledge and that that will lead to improved outcomes for children and families. But I think that's enough from me at the moment. And Joe, I'll hand back to you. Thanks, Ken. Um, you've, you've given me a lot to think about there. I really like the slide at the start. I think it, the slide of the overwhelm with the big wave of uh, papers coming down, I think that uh, might resonate with lots of us when we think about where to start um, incorporating research evidence or even where to start with accessing research and evidence uh, re relevant to our practice and sifting through that, what did you say, 2,000 papers per day, that sounds outrageous. Uh, luckily, most of us get to narrow down what we're looking at out of those 2,000. Um, I also really liked from that knowledge to action cycle, the, I think what it spoke to me is that it gives us lots of different opportunities for intervention, or not in, when I say intervention, I mean those opportunities to use evidence or incorporate those, integrate those different types of evidence. So in planning the question or planning the intervention or even checking what's being used. And um, I like how you finished there with ultimately it's to make programs and policies as effective as they can be and then assess that afterwards to create positive change for our communities and families. Thank you. Um, you did touch on the different kinds of evidence and I wanted to um, move on to Beth here because we had a few um, questions along similar lines as well about different types of evidence and how they can be used alongside each other uh, for evidence-informed decision-making in practice. And Beth, I know um, this is one area that you've been looking at and working on and um, to help with, at Drummond Street Services. So what kind of evidence do you include in your work at the Centre for Family Research and Evaluation? And how does research evidence contribute to evidence-informed decision-making at Drummond Street? Okay, thanks, Joe, And thanks, Ken, for the nice introduction, which kind of has placed us quite well. I think you've given us a really good grounding and framework thinking about evidence-informed decision-making and um, evidence-informed practice. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging I'm calling in from Jaja Wurrung country and I'd like to acknowledge the elders past and present of these beautiful lands. Um, so I guess in terms of bringing in evidence-based decision making, the Centre for Family Research and Evaluation is based at Drummond Street, so we're an applied research institute within an organisation which is quite a 
quite a great thing for an organisation to have, I think. Um, many organisations would love to have a little set of researchers based within the organisation. And I guess we've got a, a remit to bring in evidence to inform practice and to ensure that we can help synthesise evidence that's coming out. Um, as Ken explained, there is so much evidence out there. So what do we need to help synthesise for our practitioners and for our managers so that we can make decisions based on emerging, emerging best practice and also to build evidence. So there's a lot of evidence building and evidence generation, which happens at Drummond Street as well, which we try to capture as a team. In terms of evidence-based decision making, um, we have an evidence-based management framework. So I think if you have a look there in the handouts, you can see a copy of the evidence-based framework. And I guess it builds on the APES um, practice, research and people framework. So we really wanted to look at how we can bring different forms of evidence to inform. So we have, sorry, I have a two-month-old baby who's in the background. <laughs> So who's coming to interrupt? Sorry about that. <laughs> so basically our evidence-based decision-making framework is um, structured around organisational data. Um, sorry. <laughs> All good, yeah. These things happen. A little bit of distraction. Badly timed. Um, <laughs> so we have the organisational... Beth, oh, if you want to take a minute, let us know, and we might um, well, we could move happy. on to Amanda if you. Oh, she's happy. Yeah, <laughs> lovely. If you're happy to keep going, thank you. Good thing about being on a video cam, I can breastfeed while I'm working. <laughs> um, and so anyway. I mean, our audience are people who work with children and families, so I think you're well placed. <laughs> So in terms of the evidence-based management framework, we have organisational data, which is really critical to how our organisation works and functions. Um, in our organisational data at Drummond Street, we collect really um, comprehensive demographic data about the individuals and families who come to Drummond Street services. So not only demographic data, but their presenting needs, their risk factors, the risk alerts, what risk alerts do we currently need to manage. This paints a really interesting picture about our clients and is something that we've added into this kind of evidence-informed management we also have literature, so what literature is emerging in terms of best practice that we can integrate into particular programs and services and how do we integrate that in a way that's meaningful to practitioners who are busy, who are under stress, who are under demand, particularly during COVID when we've seen an escalation of risk across the board. We have our practitioner wisdom and expertise. How do they go at implementing evidence-based programs? How do they deal with evidence? What are they seeing on the ground and how are the people that they're working with actually um, presenting? And does that fit with the evidence that we're bringing in for them? And then our user experience. What is it that our clients coming into the services want in terms of consuming services, in terms of the services and practices that they need? So I guess we use those four different domains of knowledge and we really try to value them each equally. I think there's always been this traditional hierarchy of evidence coming from universities and you know, evidence-based programs and practice being the gold standard. But actually, when we're working with marginalised communities, how do we bring in these different forms of knowledge from the communities themselves, from the practitioners who are on the ground, and from our organisational data, which helps us analyse the certain particular demographics and risk and the cohorts that are actually turning up for our services. Um, to give equal weight to each of those four domains is kind of tricky. Um, so we've been working on it over the years and I think COVID actually presented us an opportunity to be able to implement it um, quite well. So we try, when COVID started, we, we knew that things were going to change. We knew that there was going to be things that we would need to respond to as an organisation, as a management team and as a service as service providers, practitioners on the ground. So we looked at how we could use the evidence-based management framework to learn from what was happening and to respond to what was happening quite effectively. So in terms of getting the organisational data, we started to pull that data on a regular basis. What were we seeing in terms of risk factors, risk alerts and needs? Were different risks escalating? And we saw a tripling in family violence risk, for example, and a more than doubling in suicide risk. We built in evidence from overseas and and national literature, what were other researchers seeing, what were other organisations seeing, what were other practitioners seeing. So how could we use what we were seeing at Drummond Street and compare it to what was happening on an international and national level. We looked at practitioner wisdom, what were they seeing on the ground. Um, we don't always have the opportunity to go to every single team meeting, but during the beginning of COVID we did. 
people from my team sat down at every team meeting and asked COVID related questions to our practitioners so that we could see and capture what was happening and feed that to our executive team so that we could make decisions based on what was happening. And also client voice. It's kind of tricky to get client voice during a pandemic, particularly when everybody is consuming services online. So we had to think a little bit creatively about how to do that. So we worked with um, the we worked with my evidence unit in terms of what measures could we bring in. And the University of Miami really quickly released a, a pandemic index scale. So we added that to our in-house evaluation, which is what did the first, fourth and final session. So we could see how much people's lives were being impacted across different domains of well-being as a, as a result of the pandemic. Um, we added different questions to our feedback forms about telehealth and the provision of telehealth services. Never had we provided all of our services online through telehealth. So what did that mean for people and how did they consume services in that way? We had interviews and focus groups with clients as well coming into the service. We went, uh, we had staff members go down to our commission housing and see, well, what did they need as a community in those collective units? And we helped to gather this, this information and synthesize it. We also needed to think creatively about how to share the information. So we saw risk, risk escalate. And if risk is escalating for our practitioners who for the first time are working at home, isolated from their computers while managing everything else, the chaos that happens inside a home, <laughs> then how could they get that information and read it in a way that was helpful to them? So we actually built some interactive online reports. And what these allowed people to do was to interact with information. You didn't have to sit and read a lengthy PDF document that was hard to consume. You could actually paint your own journey through an interactive online platform and be able to read the bits that were relevant to you or the bits that you needed to read. And in fact, I've never had so many practitioners email me and say, oh my God, we love the interactive platform. You tricked me into reading the whole thing and I've never read a whole one of your reports, which I'm slightly offended at that they've never read a whole report, but that's okay. I know now, stick to the interactive platforms. So I guess it's things like this. How can we actually use evidence? How can we synthesize evidence? And how can we build evidence? What's happening on the ground that can feed back up as well? So this is just one example of how we try to conceptualize and use and operationalize our evidence-based management framework. But I think it provides the audience with some, some examples of different ways that it can be done and different ways that different types of knowledge can be harnessed. Beth, um, I think I've written lots of notes because I. I there's lots of things I wanted to pick up from your example there. Um, uh, and I think we'll go to the one right at the end. One of the impacts there, having people read a different kind of report. Um, what a great impact that that information has been shared onwards when maybe previously people wouldn't have. <laughs> so well done on that. Um, I think you're right. Like you did mention that it's quite it's quite lucky to have researchers sitting within an organization to have those close links. So I know not everyone who's listening today will have that situation, but um, it sounds like you've been able to make the most of it and really embed um, uh, that evidence use or evidence generation and use alongside practitioners who are working with communities um, and clients and in, um, integrate all those different kinds of knowledge to come up with these reports, come up with suggestions, come up with um, ways to collect local data as well um, and respond quickly. And I think your example of the COVID times makes a lot of sense to integrate research from around the world because that was happening on a big scale, but the local changes were really important when you need to make decisions about how to respond. Um, and it, as I was listening, it did make me think of um, actually another webinar that we recorded, I think it was late last year with Amanda, which was about um, was it about collecting and using data within organisations? So I'd encourage people if you're interested along um, to have a look back for the recording on our website on that one too. Um, thanks so much, Beth. And nice to meet your daughter on the, on the camera too. Um, Amanda, I'd like to um, throw to you now and just, um, I think because you can build on Beth's experiences there, you've, you've been working with organisations and practitioners to support the use of evidence in decision making and practice for a long time. You've got, I mean, you presented in our data webinar, you've got experience in the, at the collection and use end. Um, are you able to tell us a bit more about your experiences, please? And 
what are some of the factors maybe that help or hinder practitioners who are trying to incorporate research evidence or evidence into their decision making? And what have you seen work to overcome those challenges? Yeah, thank you. And um, it's a uh, no baby here, so it's a hard act to follow from Beth, and um, and no slides either. So I feel I feel unprepared without props. But um, I think um, you know I'm in a really fortunate position where my entire role at the moment is actually around how do we translate evidence into practice and looking at how we bridge that gap and really for the for the ultimate um, gain of making improvements in terms of the way we work with children and families. And um, as you know, you mentioned that. I've worked probably for the last 18 or so years in the child protection space, both as a practitioner, but also as a, um, a manager and a leader and really looking at service design and development. Um, and so creating programs and, and then reporting on programs and outcomes. And then, um, you know, later on uh, looking at uh, things from a system policy perspective within government um, and now more research um, to translation and reflecting on that and, um, uh, for this webinar and really highlighting, you know, that slide at the beginning from Ken, it's, I think we've all been there where we've kind of gone to look at a subject or a topic or we're faced with a new client or a challenge and the mass of information is just so overwhelming. And so if I put my practitioner hat on, how do we manage that and how do we kind of sift through all the, all the noise to, to find what we need? And I think the for me, there's three really broad factors that I think block or kind of hinder practitioners from being able to translate evidence into practice. And the first one really is really that cultural, uh, that culture and leadership. So at that organisational level, if there's not a culture that really supports that continuous improvement and a genuine, um, genuine quest to review our practice and to look at the outcomes and to do self-assessment and ongoing development, then that's going to be a huge, a huge barrier. And, and the second one is really competing demands. And this I think happens at the practice system and the organisational level. So, um, you know, we have, uh, we might have specific contracts that have fixed service models or a prescribed list of things that we need to do with clients, regardless of what sector we're working with or tight requirements. Um, we have often high workloads and caseloads and, you know, picking up on the, the previous comment from Beth, you know, we've also got this rapidly changing um, environment of COVID now. And so I remember myself when we had to pivot within a couple of days from face-to-face -face therapy to, to online therapy, it was, well, gosh, where do we get the literature for that? And where do we find out, you know, where's the best evidence base for this and how do we do this? And so there's, you know, those competing demands, I think at all the levels are a huge factor and, um, the lack of flexibility and funding and resources that sometimes exist. And, and then the third factor that I think is probably uh, the biggest barrier from a practitioner level is we've got no idea where to start sometimes. So all we see is that sea of kind of, you know, there's thousands of documents, which Ken, I was horrified, there's 2,000 a day in your area. Um, and it's overwhelming. And, you know, where do you start? And that that's a real challenge. So I think, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough over the years to be involved personally in, in those projects where you have a lovely partnership with research. And so you have practitioners working alongside university supported researchers, alongside policy, um, and you have this, this lovely kind of um, enmeshment and feeding in of this continuous improvement. And that's, that's great. And you know, here in WA, I think um, Home Stretch is a great example where we've got um, practitioners working alongside researchers, working alongside government, um, and there's this continuous kind of uh, feedback loop and, and changing of and translation of evidence into practice, and acknowledging lived experience as well as practice wisdom and literature, both you know nationally and internationally. Um, but that's always, you know, that's not always possible, and so. I think the, some of the best long-term change, particularly embedding that culture of valuing evidence translation into practice and overcoming some of those barriers has been through development of communities of practice. And so um, if I think about uh, when I, um, many years ago, I established a, um, a large psychology, psychology team. So, and then later on a multidisciplinary team of about 60, uh, 60 odd staff. And 
all from a range of different backgrounds, but all focused on child abuse and trauma um, and assessment and responses, both in a kind of a clinical um, setting, but then in an outreach setting as well. And um, I'll, I remember one of the first things that um, my chief executive at the time tasked me with um, before I could expand services was to go out and see if we were doing the right thing and um, you know, see what models are out there, see what, um, what uh, theories and what type of services we should be providing. And so I, you know, I did um, my uh, good university kind of due diligence and I turned to the literature and I did lots of searches and I looked at the, at the sector and what other people were doing. And, and then I was able to prepare a paper that went up to the CE and made a whole bunch of recommendations on where we should go. And so I had this lovely time that was contained to review and reflect and then implement. And then of course, you know, work happened and um, clients happened. And as a leader, I was struck with, well, how do we keep doing this when we don't have time in our day to day? And so I realized that what we had is this huge communities of practice where we had such rich knowledge and so, by utilising a kind of a hybrid of a, a peer supervision model, but bringing in research and bringing in um, practice wisdom and lived experience from a really, a really broad range of practitioners across different geographical locations, from different disciplines and different theoretical orientations. Um, you know, some practitioners were brand new and they were students studying at the time and others had been in the field for 20 odd years. Um, some had specialties in child sexual abuse and others in family violence. And so how can we create a community of practice where, you know, I don't have to read every journal article, but I can present one that's particularly relevant to me and share it with the team. Um, you know, I don't have to attend every training on everything, but I can go to one particular training that's of interest and I can share that learning and share those resources with the team. And we can have these robust conversations and. And so what we were able to very successfully create is, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a culture of um, a culture of sharing and a culture of learning that was based on real life practice, um, sharing of research evidence as well, but you know, sharing the load. So, you know, if we think about that wave at the beginning from Ken, um, we don't all have to kind of manage that wave on our own. We can actually all stand together and share the information and just take a little piece of it um, and really work through it. And we've more recently in a university setting, we've taken that concept of, of a communities of practice and tied it a bit more to, to kind of formal training um, in the sector. And so rather than doing a traditional kind of face-to-face -face tutorial style um, interaction, we've we've used this communities of practice model to look at, okay, how can we um, have highly skilled kind of facilitators, but how can we draw upon the collective practice knowledge around the room from a diverse range of practitioners to exchange evidence and to learn and reflect and influence each other's practice. And, and I think it's really, a by coming together, I think it's a simple and effective way, it's relatively cost effective and to influence um, to influence one another and a simple way to support practitioners to, to take on that kind of review, reflect and implement um, practice. And it's a way to also kind of build a culture within an organisation that can then kind of um, feed up into policy and service design. Um, but it's something that practitioners can do very easily, um, you know, and draw upon the huge wealth of information that, that we have as a collective sector. Um, rather than having to do it alone or in a really structured um, partnership with the research institute, all those those things, which are lovely, but um, we're not all fortunate enough to have those available to us at all times. So communities of practice for me has certainly been a way that I think um, I've had experience in success in, in, in that, and it really has developed my practice and developed how I look at research and evidence from a whole range of different perspectives and how that's embedded um, into practice, but also service design um, and models of, um, of programs and things as well. I think that's really interesting, Amanda. Um, uh, I like how 
I think the way you explained it was that you had a common topic as a focus, but everyone came from mm. different perspectives, from theory, mm. from practice, mm -hmm. and position in an organisation. So I really like the ideas mm. of sharing there, um, mm. maybe cross organisations as well, which means you, you get to reflect mm. in a different way. I did have a practical mm. question: How often did you do you meet in that communities of in community of practice? Yeah, so we um, we established them originally monthly. But what we found is that it spills out out of the group. So um, it then you end up with ad hoc conversations or you might be having a, a challenging client or an issue and you can draw on someone within the group. You can say, you know, I'm, I'm having this having this problem or this concern or I'm not quite where to go. Who's read something recently on this issue that might be helpful or do you have a resource that we can exchange? And so they they kind of grow and they morph and they become really organic and kind of self-determining, which I think is the lovely thing about communities of practice. They don't have to be organisationally driven. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be line management and it doesn't have to be in policy or practice. It can be, you know, derived from the practitioner level. Um, and you can, you know, you can meet as as often or as, as um, little as you like. And I think, you know, in this virtual world that we're now living in, we're not, we're not hampered by can we physically get to the one location and those type of things as well? So that's that's shown us a lot, I think, over the last couple of years too. Yeah, that's a really good point. The transition to online has some benefits for mm. for those mm. meetings and networks and creating networks. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, I also really liked your the starting point of the question when you were starting out. Are we mm. doing the right thing? I think that's probably a really common question for practitioners and, and managers and even organisations. Mm -hmm as a starting point when they're looking for using yeah. evidence and as a really as a way in um, mm -hmm. to thinking more about well, what what do we need to know? Are we doing the right thing? <laughs> yeah. I certainly mm -hmm. know from my experience that's a that's been a big starting point. Um, Beth, I was wondering if you had any examples to follow up on of work that you've been involved in that can, has overcome that has helped overcome some of these challenges, maybe the challenges of time or the challenges of embedding um, uh, incorporating research evidence in an organization. And I know you've given us some really great examples already, but I wonder if there was anything else you wanted to some things that support this process of maybe improving culture or changing culture towards um, learning and sharing or using evidence. Yeah, so I think um, it's building on what Amanda said, creating the spaces. So the communities of practice are creating spaces where people can share insight, knowledge and evidence in a way that's really constructive to help build team environments around emerging evidence and practice. And it's that idea yeah, that you don't have to do it all, that you can, you can take one bit of knowledge and share that. Um, I guess within Drummond Street, there's been a real move building on what we've found during COVID to think about how the organisation can actually now function as an organisation going forward. And I guess we're really lucky to have a management team that is really curious and really wants to bring in evidence and build evidence. So, you know, there's been a lot of literature scoping that's happened from our team in terms of what might work, what what could we see work in terms of place-based interventions, um, how can we build on our integrated service response models or integrated program models, um, but also then taking what we're seeing to practitioners and having their input and insight as well. So these are the problems we're seeing. These are some bits of evidence that we've been pulling, but what do you think would work on the ground? How do we create the processes and systems and structures which will actually help to enable the, the in, incorporation of evidence within the work? And how do we really enhance the voice of community? And I think that's a critical thing that we really want to do all the time. So. We work with marginalised communities. We don't want to take models that are not appropriate to them and try and implement them. We want to know what is actually going to work to support them. So I guess when we're scoping models and scoping evidence, we're always scoping evidence that has been worked and used in different contexts with different communities. It's not just normed on, you know, a white population and then exported from a city and trying to do it in a regional setting for example so so what has worked with diverse communities what are some ways that we can can manage risks in organizations so if we're bringing in a new model how do we actually set up systems and structures to make sure that people who engage in that new model and new service remain safe so 
even thinking about our structures and supervision processes. So can we have a practice lead, for example, who oversees the new program and the work being carried out by different practitioners so that that process can help us to build evidence as well? Is the program working? Are the types of evidence we're bringing in appropriate within the context within which we're trying to implement it? So. I guess for me, it's about bringing in evidence, but it's also about creating space to reflect on, is this the best evidence that we have brought in and does it work within this context? And having management that are curious to know if it works and if it doesn't work, how can we improve it? Or do we need to change and try something else because this approach is not working? And I think, yeah, creating space and having the environment for curiosity is a really great way to start to be able to find systems and structures that can work within your organisation or within your particular field. Yeah, I love that word curios curiosity. Um, I think it it makes it a little bit more, um, I don't know, easier to grasp than talking about evidence or using evidence. But I mean, at the, at the heart of it, it is a curiosity and a desire to improve or um, willingness to improve, learn, learn and improve. Um, so that's really interesting to hear. Um, and the idea of creating space, and I sort of heard some examples of creating space by giving it to someone in a role or giving it to, or embedding it as part of a process, that time for reflection. And I think they're really interesting um, examples of how it could be, yeah, in, in, implemented within an organisation. Um, I'm just noting the time and we do want to make sure we get questions uh, we want to get to some of our questions from our audience. I actually have a great question, which segues here for Ken. Um, one of the questions, we got a few from registration and they're starting to come through now as well, is building on from Amanda and Beth, this idea of, well, there are challenges at that broader level. There are challenges in our funding systems and there are challenges um, in the way we have to report or the, the big drivers at the really high level policy levels. Um, what uh, I think you might be able to talk to this a little bit here. What are some of the factors that might be at play to support or challenge the use of research evidence more broadly in our in our sectors, in our fields? Yeah, thanks, Joe. And I, I have to say, I, I have to wholeheartedly agree uh, with Amanda and, and Beth and all of their really insightful uh, comments and reflections. And I think, really, in my work, the question for me is, how do we how are we as a community, as a, a research community, as a practice community, as a policy community, with an interest in, in improving outcomes for children and families, developing an integrated culture that brings this together in a meaningful way? Uh, and I think within our organisations, that's that's kind of one approach and, 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 and within our own practice, that's one approach. But thinking system-wide and, and in terms of system-wide reform, I think is 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 necessary and and to what extent can we each in our roles and as organizations advocate with funders with expectations around doing this work uh, and and i think touching on something that amanda said around organizational culture i mean this is a kind of a fundamental that we have found in our work uh, that you can't really approach this in a meaningful way but i think with that um, and influencing organisational culture are those expectations and drivers uh, and all of the subsequent incentives and disincentives. And so I think within research contexts, there, are, there is a pressure to publish in peer-reviewed journals, which produces that tsunami of evidence that probably no one else except other researchers can readily engage with and probably other researchers aren't really readily engaging with that evidence either. So how do we kind of bring that together? And I, I think to kind of, you know, turn that question around a little bit, I think, and, and to kind of follow on with what Amanda was saying about communities of practice that has certainly been uh, the approach that we are taking in the health and medical research sector that we do need a networked approach to share and learn but also to importantly fail because it, we will trip over when we're doing this work this is complex as I've acknowledged a few times but one of the key ways of learning is having the safe space to not always succeed and to be able to be open and honest about that with each other and with our funders and with our communities. But importantly, and to Beth's point about bringing people together. And so one of the other areas that I'm working with across Melbourne Children's, so the Children's Hospital, the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and the, and the University of Melbourne, is building capacity for co-production and co-design of research, but also of policy and practice. And so making sure that from the outset, we are bringing together all of those different uh, custodians of knowledge, of lived experience, and of different processes to address these challenges. So that the, the research questions that we ask are relevant and appropriate, 
are likely to inform practice, but are also informed by the most pressing policy and practice needs. Uh, and so I think that, you know, th there is a whole lot there that we could unpack, and this is just the beginning. But I also think I, I've got a kind of a provocation for you, maybe, and in this notion of community of practice, you know, we kind of have that here with the CFCA webinars. Um, you know, th there is this kind of, uh, kind of group of, of, of practitioners and professionals across Australia who are wanting to develop in this space. And I wonder, you know, I wonder whether there's an opportunity here in this online space to kind of expand it. We may have our own smaller communities of practice, but there's a, I think there's a bigger opportunity here potentially. Challenge accepted. <laughs> um, yeah, Ken, the network element is really important. I think it, like you were saying, it, it feeds on, um, both what Amanda and Beth were saying about the importance of networks and having time for sharing. And I really liked that idea of uh, maybe improving or developing that, I don't think you use these words, but permission to fail um, in this process. And I think, I mean, my terms that I use a lot are learning and improvement. So, I mean, learning, we're learning and people, when they're learning, they make mistakes. So I think um, including that in the way we, we work and, and that kind of, not being afraid to to fail and know that we're trying to improve based on what information we have, then that's a really um, nice way to approach it. Um, we are getting lots of questions coming through. I think I'm just going to jump around a little bit and uh, actually, no, I think I might pick up on some of the ones around culture because I think almost everyone's mentioned culture and we've got a couple of questions because culture can be a little bit nebulous. Um, we've had some great examples about building culture. So starting by doing, starting by sharing and then informing and letting that filter up into different parts of the organisation or with Beth's example of um, having really curious management, which sort of filters down through the organisation. Um, I might put to the whole panel, what are some simple tips or strategies for teams to build an evidence-informed culture. Does anyone have any other tips they'd like to add? I think um, I might start by sharing. I think from a, if I think about a, a manager kind of level and a program manager level, um, we, when we develop or design a program and receive funding for a program, we have to produce outcomes and you, in a very simplistic way, certainly in the child protection sector, we're moving much more towards a, if you can't show outcomes and demonstrate that what you're doing is actually making a genuine impact and difference, then you won't get refunded or you certainly won't get C funding for new innovative approaches or to try something new. And so you, there's a massive drive there. There's a massive kind of um, push and that should be a huge motivating factor um, and which could, start at that middle management level um, and filter up or filter down, or even start from a board or chief executive and executive leadership level and, and filter down through the organisation. But there's a, there's a, a significant amount of um, co-design that's now kind of going on around outcomes. And how do we look at moving away from outputs and widgets and counting, you know, how many sessions we do with a client and genuinely look at what we're actually doing and talk to our clients. I mean, I use the word client very broadly here, but how can we talk to our service users and see, you know, is, is that thing that we're actually doing, is it making a difference? And if it is, let's capture it and let's talk about it. And, you know, we can report on it and funding and growth should be a huge motivating factor for, for organisations at that executive level. But we can push that as, as program managers in terms of pushing it up and pushing it down. Because if I can, if I can demonstrate that my team is under-resourced and um, over-servicing or, you know, there's um, not enough of their FTE, I can make a really good case for additional funding or additional supports. And so I, I think I, I kind of see that motivator of money, if you like, to put it bluntly, as an excellent motivator up and down um, in an organisation to, to create that culture. Um, it's a necessary part of, of funding at the moment. Yeah. It's a good point, Amanda, and a lot of things, I mean, it does seem to make sense to start with what you have to do, <laughs> start with what you've got and start with what's mandated. And I mean, and I like the idea that things are being increasingly co-designed to make more sense and be mm -hmm. more meaningful, but if it is something you have to report on, why not use it as a starting point to embed those um, 
processes, systems, mm -hmm. culture within an organisation and build on it from there. Yeah, mm -hmm. great example. Mm -hmm. Did anyone else want to add any other tips for building culture? I do have a similar question I might ask in a moment, if not. No? Okay. Um, I think for me, it's finding your champions. Um, yep. So there's always champions within an organisation and there are always people who see the value of bringing in evidence-based mm. practice and evidence-informed practice. So I think if we can mm. find those champions and let them do the work or let them lead the work, that's a really good way to get it, to kick it off. Mm. And I, I, I was just going to follow up. So I was just going to say that, I, you know, I think that that kind of top-down, bottom-up approach is the really the only feasible way. There does need to be leadership mm. in this space. It does need to be driven by motivated, enabled uh, workers on the ground but I think that there, there is that you know to, to Amanda's point around resourcing is that we do need to build capacity to do this well uh, and we do need to invest in upskilling and training we can't just say oh this is a great idea now go we, we have to have a structured way of enabling uh, this important work as well. Mm. Yeah, really important points. I'm going to ask a similar question because I think it feeds on, it um, builds on what we've been talking about nicely. Does anyone on the panel have advice on how to persuade peers to embrace data and embed research findings in operations? So we've started talking about that, but what are your most persuasive uh, lines that you use maybe? I, maybe, maybe. Bribery always helps. Bribery. <laughs> about, about incentives and I think like you know that I think yeah. I mentioned incentives briefly and I think incentives happen at the organizational level they or they also happen at the kind of the funding level and so in health and medical mm. research a couple of incentives that we've been working towards I mean it's sad that you have to kind of go straight to the, the carrot and the stick um, I think some people are kind of inherently kind of intrinsically driven and see the value uh, so I think showcasing mm -hmm. the value is an important thing but also in terms of promotion and criteria for researchers making sure that they are working to co-design and co-develop and co-produce and translate mm -hmm. their work is something which is important but then the other thing essentially is that in health and medical research to be funded you need to be showing that you do have a translational pathway that you will engage uh, with lived experience representatives that you will be working with other practitioners or the community to ensure that what you discover will not just sit on the shelf or in a peer-reviewed journal article so I think that yeah a multi-pronged multimodal approach is probably the best Mm. Anyone else? I think um, a, a practice example I have comes kind of out of Ken's point around that, um, you know, permission to fail and not saying failure is a failure, but it's an opportunity to learn. And I think working with practitioners for many years when there is, uh, when they're struggling with a client or a presentation or kind of a bit stuck, actually supporting them at a very case level to actually return to the data, look at the evidence, you know, looked at the look at the symptom tracking. So it's a very granular level, but using that kind of stuckness and and uh, not knowing where to go, using that as a point to actually go, well, let's let's do something a bit different. Let's look to the data in terms of how that client's actually tracking over time. Let's look to the research evidence. Let's look to other experts in the field to to get some ideas. And so that I think at a very micro level is um, at, you know what I would use to to influence in that space. Yeah, nice one. Okay, um, so another question we've got here is, I think this one's for you, Ken. Um, someone would appreciate hearing, thinking on the differences between evidence-based practice and practice-based evidence. Are you able to talk to that one for a minute, please, Ken? Yeah, definitely, and it's a, it's a great question. And my response is going to be a simple one and hark back uh, to those different types of knowledge and that informed, uh, that evidence informed approach that I put up on my slide. And I think it really just depends on where we sit. Uh, what kind of custodian of knowledge are we? If we're a practitioner, then we're probably going to be looking to ensure that our practice and our decision making and our activities is informed by the best available research evidence and what we know uh, from lived experience representatives. So I think it really is just about shifting our perspective based on where we sit and what custodian uh, of knowledge we find ourselves in at any particular point. Okay, nice one. Oh, this is a, a good straightforward one. Um, Beth, everyone's quite excited. What interactive platform did you use to present the data that you were and the report that you were talking about? 
Yeah, so the platform is called Genially, um, and it's just one of the platforms that we found online. There are a number of them. This was the cheapest. We're a not-for-profit, so that fit in well with us. Um, it is a little bit fiddly when you first start to use it. Um, the senior research officer who pulled it all together originally does sometimes have a twitching left eye when we bring up, can we do another Genially report? But once you get your head around it, it it's quite... Um, easy to use and navigate, particularly for those reading the report. So yeah, the platform was genially, but have a Google and look at other platforms as well if um, you don't feel like you've got tech savvy people in the team and want to go with one that's a little bit more straightforward. Nice one. I actually had never thought that be multiple platforms or I'm sure that of course there are but things out there to do interactive reports. Thanks so much, Beth. Um, so this is a really good question that's come through as well. I think we might all be able to add something to this one. Um, how might practitioners navigate the conflicts that can arise when research takes us in different directions? And it sounds like a bit of a complex one. Um, Amanda, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I think um, uh, I think the first thing is to really acknowledge the tension there sometimes between practice and, and research and if we think about and when we think about research uh, if, I, if I put a practitioner head on um, quite often we think about research in a clinical setting where uh, on different models or um, approaches or um, things that we should implement with a whole range of different um, uh, concerns within within community and within families um, but Quite often the research that's done in a very pure setting or it's, it's not in a real life context because we we screen out clients that have comorbid kind of presentations or they don't quite fit or from minority uh, you know specialty kind of uh, groups that need a particular focus and so what we end up with is something that doesn't look like our setting that we work in and so I think as practitioners first of all we need to be able to critically reflect reflect and evaluate the research that we're looking at and then really acknowledge the tension that exists. So, for example, if I think about um, some of my earlier work looking at um, things like trauma-focused CBT, for example, and so this is a very specific example, but um, it's, you know, can apply to a whole range of different settings. Trauma-focused CBT and EMDR are two therapies that are really well evidenced in the literature as um, appropriate treatments for um, child trauma and child abuse and, and complex trauma. But, you know, EMDR, for example, is very expensive to actually train people in, so it might not work for all settings. Um, trauma-focused CBT relies on a, a high kind of cognitive capacity and can be really difficult if you've got children and families who are currently um, still within uh, trauma and within complex kind of environments. Um, EMDR needs a supportive, secure based and caregiver for treatment to be able to be used. A lot of the families I work with don't have that, you know, they're in the care system or the carers are changing or mum and dad are managing a whole bunch of stuff as well. So there's a real disconnect sometime between what the research says in terms of its purest form around what's an evidence-based practice and what's actually going to work in the real life context. And so as practitioners, the first thing that we can do, I think, is critically evaluate it and acknowledge that tension and if we can talk about that tension and we can acknowledge it, we can look to how we might need to adapt things without interrupting the fidelity of the model, which is a whole other kind of webinar. Um, but what, what pieces we actually need to, um, to think about when we apply that evidence-based practice in a real life situation and where the research might not reflect that, um, I think is, is the first thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, a good point. And I think it really goes back to your example about sharing with others. And um, mm -hmm. when you're, you're reflecting on what's been presented in the research, but you're also putting those ideas to others in practice and you might be in yeah. different positions, and different perspectives to interpret it for your setting. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, did anyone else want to add anything on this question? How might we, how might yeah. practitioners navigate the conflicts? Yeah, Beth, yeah. I I think it's important as well to think about how the practitioners can then feed back to research as well. So it's not a linear process that goes top down. We need to think about mm -hmm. how we can continue to 
if, if it's not working within a particular context or if it's not the right evidence base to be incorporating, how does that feed back into research? How does it feed back into mm -hmm. the ways that we're delivering services, the ways that services are being funded? So both in terms of policy advocacy, but also research advocacy. And I think there's a real mm -hmm. ability there if we do talk about the complexity and the issues for research and practice to work better together um, so that we can come up with frameworks that do actually work within a particular context that can be be seen as best practice because best practice is only best practice if it works um, within the environments within which we're working. Yeah, that's a really good point. And you make me think of Ken's slide on the the cycle rather than the, the linear, so the knowledge to action cycle yeah. it involves fe providing feedback to researchers, definitely. Um, did you want to add anything there, Ken, on the on the cycle or on anything else? Well, only to reflect back on that cycle and say this needs to be multi-directional because I do work with researchers who say exactly the same thing, but from the research angle. And so I think we all need to we all need to work and kind of, I guess, find new ways potentially of working better together to ensure that research is informed by practice and that practice is informed by research and those connections are well facilitated, facilitated and we have the capacity to do that and enable that uh, in, in a productive and meaningful way. Yeah, fantastic. I wanted to finish with the panel by asking what's one piece of advice or what's one tip that you'd like to give our audience that can help them feel like there's something they can do, something manageable that they can do maybe tomorrow, maybe at some other point to start incorporating research evidence into decision making. Um, am I able to go alphabetical? Amanda, please. <laughs> sure. Um, I think my... Um... My advice would be to to start small and start early. And I think um, you know, if establish your own communities of practice. So everyone now online could reach out to a few networks. Doesn't have to be within the same org. Doesn't even have to be within the same discipline. But in a you know a general kind of connection, you know, make a time to meet. Um, you know, share cases, successes, and failures, and share trainings and your experience, and be open and and really kind of adopt that process of reviewing, reflecting and implementing with your peers and, you know, share one of those 2000 pieces that you might have read. Um, but, you know, do that tomorrow. It's an active step that I think people can do very simply. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, Beth, please. What's your top tip? I think finding what will work for your organisation. So who works for the organisation? What what steps are already in place, what already exists. So how can you leverage up existing um, existing communities of practice, for example, existing groups that are meeting? Do you need to get everybody together and buy lunch and go through <laughs> synthesise research and have sessions set up? Like, does bribery actually need to be part of it to get your practitioners along? Or is it a good way to start to then get that great um, buy-in from people who then want to support and continue to to move and grow. So I think your organisations will be different. It might be needed at the management level, it might be needed at the practitioner level. What's going to work for you? Have a think about it. Thanks, Beth. Ken, what's your final top tip for people? Well, I feel, I feel like um, I, I completely agree with, with Amanda and Beth, but I, I feel like my mantra in this work is the perfect is the enemy of the good. And so Iterative approaches are the only approaches that will be effective. You can't, you know, you, you're not going to be able to transform, you know, your practice or the organisation, uh, you know, overnight. But in terms of um, next steps, I, I would encourage everyone to acquaint themselves with the accessible information out there around these processes. There is a wealth of information on the CFCA website, and and we can share some additional tools and resources uh, if if um, uh, people on the on, on the webinar have particular questions around key issues. Uh, but I also think that each of you will be a custodian of one of those types of knowledge that we talked about, and probably multiple types of those knowledge. And and I guess to maybe paraphrase Amanda's perspective, I would say what you could do after this is find another custodian of a different type of knowledge and begin a conversation. Uh, and, and through that process, you will begin to increase your understanding and their understanding and, and, and take the first steps towards a kind of integrated change. Amazing. Thanks so much, Ken. Um, thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Beth. I feel like we've only just scratched the surface. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. And thank you, everyone, for attending and sending in your questions. Um, I think we might be end at the end of our time here. So thank you so much for a really great discussion. Um, yeah, it's it's been a, a fabulous one. We've we've covered lots and at the same time there's much more to be covered. Um, 
I think we might just jump off now and thanks everyone for attending and I'll let everyone say goodbye. Thanks for having us. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye.